Please be seated. In the name of God, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I will begin my sermon with an outrageous statement. Advent is a season of the church year that focuses on what theologians call the doctrine of eschatology, the last things. But in the last few decades, we seem to be moving into an era without eschatology. If that is so, the Christian notion of eschatology seems to be increasingly irrelevant to contemporary culture. What do I mean when I say that the contemporary era is one without eschatology? This has not always been the case. In the mid-20th century, the philosopher Karl Loeth wrote a book called Meaning in History, in which he claimed that modern philosophies of history were secularized versions of a Christian theology of history. Hegelianism, Marxism, the secular notion of progress, all of these were basically secularized notions of the Christian understanding of divine providence. Modern secularism believed that history was moving in a single direction toward a goal. However, the goal was not a Christian new heavens and a new earth, but some version of a secular paradise. These were eschatologies in which humanity had taken the place of God. All of this seems to have changed in the last couple of decades. I would suggest that this is because postmodernity is no longer living on borrowed memories. A belief in a secular eschatology was possible only so long as Christian notions of history, providence, and eschatology were still somewhat taken for granted without asking where such notions came from. The philosopher Charles Taylor has claimed that we now live in a secular age, an age marked by what Taylor calls the imminent frame. The imminent frame is the notion that everything in the world is part of a natural order without any reference to anything outside of itself and an imminent causal order. The imminent frame is what happens when unbelief is the default option for how people live in postmodern culture. Within the imminent frame, secular notions of progress or any kind of optimistic vision of the direction in which history might be moving does not make real sense. The shift from living in a world of secular progress to living exclusively in the imminent frame means that we now seem to be living in a world of normal nihilism. What do I mean by normal nihilism? In an essay written a few years ago, David Bentley Hart suggested that the nihilist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche had made a fundamental miscalculation. When postmodern people stopped believing in God, they did not conclude that life was meaningless or become nihilists in Nietzsche's sense. Instead, they found ways to distract themselves. They went shopping. Roman Catholic theologian William T. Kavanaugh has suggested that consumerism is the new secular eschatology. In reality, says Kavanaugh, consumerism is the death of Christian eschatology. In consumerism, there can be no actual break with the current status quo, but only a hunger for constant superficial novelty. Consumerism wishes for everything and hopes for nothing. If the church is going to speak to a culture of normal nihilism, a secular culture in which people take the imminent frame for granted, we will need to discover the key themes of rediscover, the key themes of Christian eschatology. In an earlier generation, German theologian Wolfhard Pannenberg provided some helpful hints about what that should mean. Like other theologies, Pannenberg's theology has come and gone, but I think that he might still have something to say to us about eschatology. So first, Christian theology always takes place within the tension between two realities. On the one hand, theology has to be concerned with God's faithfulness to God's revelation in Jesus Christ, as this is contained in Scripture. On the, other, on the other hand, the God who has been revealed in Jesus Christ is also the creator of all things. This means that theology must not only talk about what God has done in Christ, but also about God's relation to creation, as well as the way in which theology is related to all truth whatsoever. If theology only focuses on biblical revelation, it can become sectarian and truncated, as in some versions of confessional theology. On the other hand, if theology sees its task as simply one of appropriating truth in general, 
it will just repeat back to the culture whatever it hears from it, as is typical of liberal theology. Pannenberg claimed that the common theme that can hold together both the particularity of revelation and the universality of God as the creator of all that is, is that of history. It's well known that revelation in history was a major focus of Pannenberg's theology, but it would be a mistake to think that Pannenberg was talking about history in some vague general sense. Rather, for biblical Israel, God was understood not only as the creator of the world, but God had acted in particular, in particular events in the history of Israel in which God has made himself known. God is a living God, and God is known because in history God has made both promises and has fulfilled those promises. It is in, the, in this tension between promise and fulfillment that Israel discovered the meaning of history. Initially, God's promises were understood in a limited and specific way. For example, in the earlier days of the nation of Israel, hope was directed toward the immediate future. When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, they seemed to have had one immediate hope, deliverance from the bondage of Egypt so that God could lead his people to the promised land and make them secure in that land. Later, Israel's hopes were connected to such things as the succession of the throne of King David. The prophet Nathan promised David a successor to his throne. In time, however, these hopes expanded beyond immediate fulfillment. As Israel's all too ordinary leaders disappointed the hopes of the people and as Israel's survivor, survival as a nation was threatened by outside invasion and ultimately Israel went into exile, the hope that was originally grounded in ordinary political rulers, kings like David or his descendants, did not fade. Instead, Israel's prophets began to make promises of a hope that could not be fulfilled in ordinary history. God's initial promises to Israel as a nation thus became universalized. The prophets proclaimed that nothing short of a complete remaking of the universe would do to satisfy shattered hopes. When hope was satisfied, the lion would lie down with the lamb. The child would play over the den of the poisonous asp and would not be hurt. The righteous descendant of David would be no longer a merely ordinary king, but an emissary who rules on behalf of God in an earthly paradise. Only the creator could bring about such a reversal of the way things are. The particularity of God's revelation to Israel was combined with the understanding that God is creator of all things to imagine a future that would mean salvation for the entire creation. New Testament Christianity stands in continuity with this Old Testament understanding of eschatology, but with a significant twist. And we see this in Jesus' proclamation of the presence of the kingdom of God. Though Jesus looked forward to the future coming of God's kingdom, as did other Jews of his time, he also claimed that something radically different was happening. Jesus claimed that glimpses of God's future kingdom of fulfilled hopes and reversed values were already present, already being anticipated in his own deeds and words. So Jesus acted as if the poor and the meek were already blessed. He healed the sick, and he brought God's mercy to the sinners with whom he ate and drank, even as the future Davidic king was supposed to do. In particular, it is in the light of the death and resurrection of Jesus that Israel's hope for the future was reinterpreted. The resurrection of Jesus means that the resurrection of all people that the Old Testament prophets predicted would take place at the end of history had now appeared in this one man, Jesus. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, the New Testament church saw in him the righteous king like David who would fulfill Old Testament prophecy. In addition, the New Testament went further than this. Jesus' resurrection was not only an anticipation of humanity's future, but the resurrection made clear that in the person of Jesus, the God who had created and was going to recreate the world had become one of us as a fellow creature. The resurrection made clear that Jesus was the son of his father, the one who, though he had existed in the form of God, had emptied himself to become a servant to die on a cross, and who after his death was exalted to the right hand of God to receive the name above every name. This, reason, this risen Jesus would return to reign as king 
He is the one before whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That the church has continued to believe that Jesus was and is and will be the king of the Jews, the righteous descendant of David, was founded on the belief that Jesus had overcome death. That death still reigns so often is a continual challenge to the assertion that Jesus is king. That Jesus is king is the church's affirmation that death will not have the last word. The church, has continued to, the church has continued to exist only because it believes that Jesus' kingship will not always be hidden, because it believes he will return and set all things right. Jesus offers present hope only because in the end he offers cosmic hope. We can see this connection between God's particular revelation in the history of Israel and Jesus and the eschatological fulfillment of creation in a couple of today's lectionary readings. The reading from Malachi talks about a messenger who will prepare the way of the Lord, a Lord who will come suddenly to his temple. Christians certainly have interpreted this messenger as John the Baptist, and the Lord who comes to his temple is easily read as a reference to Jesus' own cleansing of the temple in Jerusalem. But then the passage goes on to describe this coming Lord in images of the eschatological judgment of the Old Testament day of the Lord. He will purify the sons of Levi, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord. The Luke passage points to John the Baptist as fulfilling the promise of Isaiah. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. But the further context of the original passage in Isaiah is certainly looking forward to something eschatological and universal that would have to go beyond what happened when John baptized Jesus. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. There you have it. Promise and fulfillment, particularity and universality. An Old Testament, prophet, an Old Testament promise that had been fulfilled in Jesus, but looking forward to a time when the glory of the Lord will be revealed to all flesh. In recent years, there's been a recovered emphasis on the figural reading of the Old Testament, but one could equally call this an eschatological reading of the Old Testament. What implications might Christian hope have for a secular culture that has lost eschatology? First, we need to be clear that Christian hope is an ambivalent virtue. Hope is not an immediate product of our experience. Rather, hope contradicts what our experience now tells us. We don't now see the poor lifted up, the mournful comforted, or the meek in charge of the earth. We don't yet see God exercising his judgment as is promised in the passage from Malachi. There are still plenty of adulterers, plenty of people who lie blatantly and get away with it, lots of employers who, imbue, who abuse their employees, too many people who make the lives of widows and orphans even more miserable, and others who are more than willing to shut the door on refugees fleeing from tyrants and, home, and homelessness. Hope only exists when we are denied for the present that for which we long and dream. As long as we have what we want and life is well, we can afford to be indifferent about the future. It is only when the present is a threat that we think about a better future. We find then that we must choose between hope and despair. Hope is grounded in the assurance that eventually we will obtain what we lack now. Despair is grounded in the fear that we will not. Christian hope is not only ambivalent, it is neither utopian nor conservative. What do I mean by that? Hope is not a simple fulfillment of our this-worldly dreams, but neither is hope a nostalgic longing for an imagined way things used to be. The future we hope for is not something conjured up or ushered in by human effort. And when we're honest, we have to admit that the past was far from perfect. Modern consumerism is a blatant liar when it claims to fulfill our hopes because the kinds of things that could fulfill our deepest longings cannot be bought and sold for money. Christian hope presupposes then the fulfilling of a grander vision than the restructuring of mere economic or political realities. Christian hope presupposes the remaking of the entire universe, a hope that is not cosmic 
cannot provide the kind of final satisfaction toward which hope pushes. Even if it were possible that our goals and dreams for ourselves and for society might someday be fulfilled, at the end of the road there would still be death, and death puts an end to all dreams and hopes. We cannot have hope for even our everyday dreams without the cosmic hope that eventually all is not futile and that all will be well. When a mother tells her crying child that everything will be all right, she is offering the assurance of nothing less than a cosmic hope. And cosmic hope gives the lie to the postmodern secular age. Charles Taylor speaks of occasional glimpses of transcendence that can pierce the imminent frame, so that even secularists sometimes hope for something more. William Cavanaugh suggests that consumerism is a false form of spirituality. The unsatisfied desire for consumer fulfillment points to the need for cosmic hope, for an eschatological future in which hope will be satisfied. Cosmic hope does not, however, mean fleeing from the world or giving up on the way things are. Rather, it is our hope for the future that leads to our dissatisfaction with the way things are now. It is only hope for an ultimate future that enables us to carry on from day to day to try to make things different, if only in small ways. Though our plans and schemes for a better future for ourselves and for those we love are at most provisional, they're symptoms of that ultimate yearning without which we cannot live. Our bottomless wants are signs of a hunger that is not yet satisfied. While cosmic hope is oriented toward the eschatological future of someday, it is still granted in the con- it is still grounded in the concrete reality of that which has happened in the past. Christian hope is grounded in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our hope is in the God who raised Jesus from the dead. Because God is faithful to Jesus, we can trust him to be faithful to us. So we find that the hope of Advent is linked to the faith of Easter and the charity of Christmas. Without hope, there can be no faith that the God who gave new life to the crucified Jesus will be true to his promises to give life to us. In hope, we trust one day to experience in full the love we glimpse in the manger of Bethlehem. Because we have come to know this love made incarnate, because we have come to know this love made incarnate among us, we can be certain that this hope will not be merely a pipe dream. And finally, just as Christian hope is grounded in the concrete events of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, so it finds its expression in concrete ways whenever we wish and dream that things were different, whenever we work at even the smallest day-to-day tasks, and not least in the concrete reality of Christian communities where we worship the God of hope each Sunday morning or in seminary chapels. The gathered church is the community that lives out its life in anticipation of that future that God has planned for all the human race. The church is that distinct community that consciously lives in the tension between unfulfilled hopes and recognition of God's promises. The danger for the church, of course, is that we might be tempted to settle for the porridge of imminentist visions of hope, whether these would be nostalgic visions of the past or merely secular visions of progress. The biblical message of judgment that we hear in this morning's readings are warnings to the church as well as to secular culture to place our hopes on solid ground. The church avoids these temptations insofar as it is a community that lives with practices of hope, that gathers to hear Christ's promise proclaimed in the preached word, that shares through bread and wine in Jesus' risen body and blood, that proclaims again and again the words of eschatological hope. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Cosmic hope gives us the courage to trust in the God who meets us in a crucified and yet risen king. Let us live in the promise of St. Paul's blessing in the epistle to the Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.